All right. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to continue with my uh, series. Make sure my volume's okay here. I'm going to continue with my series on Deleuze um, and reading through some introductory work. I'm going to be reading more and more from him. So if you're interested, please subscribe. I'm going to have a playlist with different um, different titles, different works. I'm starting with some introductory stuff, and I'm going to start today from the book Negotiations, which is an interview style type book um, that really digs into a lot of his com- uh, complex concepts. And for those that are just getting into his work, it's good to kind of wrestle with the text and then refer back to some of the interviews and kind of start a feedback loop there. It's, it's really advantageous when you're really trying to crack the code um, that once you do rewards handsomely. Um, so please subscribe, like if you're interested. I'm going to have a playlist with a lot of the, the works therein. So from this book, Negotiations, there's a, a lot of different chapters. This section is entitled On Philosophy. I'm probably going to read through the section entitled On Philosophy, which is the interview. But this one is on Leibniz. Um, Deleuze wrote a book entitled The Fold, Leibniz and the Baroque, where he goes into the concept of the fold um, quite uh, intrinsically and quite thoroughly. And this interview that he does here discusses this concept and and fleshes out it out a bit. So it's good to have this in your tool belt if you are looking to um, get through that piece of work. So I'll get started here. Again, Negotiations is the book, and it's titled On Leibniz. So it's a question-answer format. Questioner, you've always said that doing philosophy is working on concepts as one works on a piece of wood and constantly producing new ones that can be used to tackle real problems. The concept of fold seems particularly useful since it allows one, by starting from Leibniz's philosophy, to characterize the Baroque and provides a way into the work of Michou or Borges, or of Maurice Leblanc or Gombrowski's Joyce, uh, Gombrowski or Joyce, or into the territory of artists. One's very tempted to ask whether a concept that works so well and takes one so far isn't in danger of losing its value by sort of inflation, and in and inviting the criticisms people used to make of systems that explain everything. Here's Deleuze. One does indeed find folds everywhere, in rocks, rivers, and woods, in organisms, in the head or brain, in souls or thought, in what we call the plastic arts. But that doesn't make the fold a universal. It was Levi Strauss, I think, who showed you had to distinguish the following two propositions, that that only similar things can differ and only different things can be similar. One proposition says similarities primary and the other thing says things themselves differ and differ above all from themselves. Straight lines are alike, but folds vary and all folding proceeds by differentiation. No two things are folded the same way. No two rocks and there's no general rule saying the same thing will always fold the same way. Folds are in this sense everywhere without the folding being a universal. It's a differentiator, a differential. There are two kinds of concepts, universals and singularities. The concept of fold is always something singular and can only get anywhere by varying, branching out, taking new forms. You've only to consider, or better still, to see and touch mountains as formed by their folding for them to lose their solidity and for millennia to turn back into what they are. Not something permanent, but time in its pure state, pliability. There's nothing more unsettling than the continual movement of something that seems fixed. In Leibniz's words, a dance of particles folding back on themselves. Here's the questioner again. Your whole book shows how Leibniz's philosophy, when one works through it with the concept of the fold, can be linked to non-philosophical realities and cast light on them. How the monad relates to other people's work in the fields of painting, sculpture, architecture, and literature. But can it also cast light on our social and political world? If the social realms become, as they say, a dark continent, isn't it because we've been thinking about it after Marx in mechanical or anatomical terms rather than in terms of folds, drapery, texture? Deleuze, Leibniz's most famous proposition is that every soul or subject, monad, is completely closed, windowless and doorless, and contains the whole world in its darkest depths. While also illuminating some little portion of that world, each monad a different portion. 
So the world is enfolded in each soul, but differently because each illuminates only one little aspect of the overall folding. It is, at first sight, a very odd conception, but as always in philosophy, one's dealing with a concrete situation. I try to show how the concept, conception applies to Baroque architecture, to the Baroque interior, to Baroque lighting. But it's our situation as modern men as well, if we take account of the new ways things are folded. The minimalist art of Tony Smith presents us with the following situation. A car speeding along a dark motorway lit only by the car's headlamps, with the tarmac hurtling, hurling by in the windscreen. It's a modern version of the monad, with the windscreen playing the part of the small illuminated area. You wonder if we can understand this socially and politically. Certainly, and the Baroque was itself linked to a political system, a new conception of politics. The move towards replacing the system of a window and a world outside with one of a computer screen in a closed room is something that's taking place in our social life. We read the world more than we see it. Not only is there social morphology in which textures play their part, but the Baroque plays a part in town planning and rural development. Architecture has always been a political activity, and any new architecture depends on revolutionary forces. You can find architecture saying, we need a people, even though the architect isn't himself a revolutionary. Through its relation to the Bolshevik Revolution, constructivism links up with the Baroque. A people is always a new wave, a new fold in a social fabric. Any creative work is a new way of folding adapted to new materials. Questioner. The concept of fold leads you on quite uh, naturally in true Leibnizian spirit to a certain conception of matter and living things, and an intensive, in, uh, insistent upon the close relation between matter and life organisms. But as, re- as I read your book, I often wonder how what you say about matter or living organisms and about perception or pain, for example, might be understood by a contemporary physicist, biologist, physiologist, and so on. Quote, the model for the science of matter is or origami, or the art of folding paper, end quote. Quote again, if, you, if, you, if to be alive is to have a soul, it's because proteins already present us with an axe of perception, discrimination, and differentiation. Matter is textures, end quote. How are, we take, how are we to take propositions like this? Sorry, how are we to take propositions like these? Inflection still plays a central part in mathematics or in the theory of functions. That matter isn't granular, but made up of smaller and smaller folds, as Leibniz says, is a hypothesis that can be interpreted in terms of the physics of particles and forces. That an organism is the theater and principle of its endogenous folding is something that comes out at the level of molecular biology as well as embryology. As Thom shows, morphogenesis is all about folding. The complex notion of texture has taken on a fundamental importance in all sorts of fields. The idea that there's such a thing as molecular perception has been accepted for a long time. When ethologists define the worlds of animals, they do so in a way that's very reminiscent of Leibniz, showing that an animal responds to a certain number of stimuli, sometimes very few, that amount to little glimmerings in the dark depths of vast nature. This isn't, of course, to say that they're repeating what Leibniz said before them. Between 17th century performation and present-day genetics, folding changes in nature, function, and meaning. But then Leibniz himself didn't invent the notion and principles of folding, which were familiar in the sciences and arts before his day. He was, however, the first thinker to free the fold by taking it to infinity. The Baroque, similarly, was the first period in which folding went on infinitely, spilling over any limit, as in El Greco and Bernini. That's why Leibniz's great Baroque principles are still so scientifically relevant, even though folding has taken on new characteristics, which illustrates its power and transformation. It's the same in art. Hentai's folds aren't, of course, El Greco's, but it was the great Baroque painters who freed folds from the constraints and limits imposed on them by Romanesque, Gothic, and neoclassical art. They thus made possible all sorts of new experiments that they didn't prefigure, but of which they they mark the they mark the opening, uh, opening phase. Malarm and Mishu are obsessed with folds. That doesn't make them Leibnizian, but it does mean they're somehow related to Leibniz. Art in Formel is based on two things, textures and folded shapes. That doesn't make Klee or Dubuffet Baroque painters, 
but the cabinet logo logo logic is like the inside of Leibnizian monad. Without the Baroque and without Leibniz, folds wouldn't have developed the autonomy that subsequently allowed them to create so many new paths. In short, the rising uh, raising to infinity or automization of folds in the Baroque has artistic, scientific, and philosophical consequences with their different time scales that are far from being exhausted and in which one keeps coming back to Leibnizian themes. Questioner. For you to be working on a theory of events is nothing new. In the fold, though, the theory is more fully worked out than ever before, most particularly through the way you bring together Leibniz and Whitehead. I can hardly summarize here the elements or determinants of events as you characterize them. But simply to say that you talk in terms of extension, intensity, individuals, and prehension is enough to make clear that the events you're talking about aren't the ones journalists and the media chase after. What then are the media handling when they quote unquote capture events? Or what would have to happen for the media to grasp what you yourself call events? Deleuze. I don't think the media have much capacity or inclination to grasp an event. In the first place, they often show a beginning or end, whereas even a short or instantaneous event is something going on. And then they want something spectacular, whereas events always involve periods when nothing happens. It's not even a matter of there being such periods before and after some event. They are part of the event itself. You can't, for example, extract the instant of some terribly brutal accident from the vast empty time in which you see it coming, starting at what hasn't happened yet, waiting ages for it to happen. The most ordinary event causes us visionaries, us as visionaries, whereas the media turn it into mere passive onlookers, or worse still, voyeurs. Gorthrasen said events always take place, so to speak, when nothing's happening. People miss the amazing weight in, in events they are least waiting, oh, least awaiting. It's art rather than the media that can grasp events. The films of Ozu or Anton Antonio, for example. But then with them, the periods in which nothing happens don't fall between two events. They're in the events themselves, giving events their depth. I have, it's true, spent a lot of time writing about this notion of event. You see, I don't believe in things. The fold returns to this question from another viewpoint. My favorite sentence in the book is, quote, there's a concert tonight, end quote. In Leibniz, in Whitehead, there are only events. What Leibniz calls a predicate is nothing to do with an attribute but an event crossing the Rubicon. So they have to completely recast the notion of a subject, what becomes of the subject, if predicates are events. It's like a Baroque emblem. Questioner. It seems to me that the fold, rather than developing your work so far, envelops it, implicates rather than explicates it. In other words, rather than taking us toward some region, a commentator's dream of Deleuze's philosophy summed up, it makes it circular, joins it all up. Indeed, the concept of the fold links up with your last book, Foucault, the folding of thought in the process of subject subjectification. And Leibniz thinks links up with a succession of studies relating to the history of philosophy, devoted to Hume, Spinoza, Kant, Nietzsche, and Bergson. The fold, in short, seems to fit in and connect with any given segment of your work so that, if you'll excuse the comparison, the whole might be likened to, say, an alarm clock that doesn't so much tell us time, the time, tell us a thing, the time, as offer infinite possible ways of being taken apart and put back together again. Am I completely wrong? Deleuze, I hope you're right, and I think you are. The thing is, everyone has habits of thinking. I tend to think of things as sets of lines to be um, unraveled, but also to be made to intersect. I don't like points. I think it's stupid summing things up. Lines aren't things running between two points. Points are where several lines intersect. Lines never run uniformly, and points are nothing but inflections of lines. More generally, it's not beginnings and ends that count, but middles. Things and thoughts advance or grow out from the middle, and that's where you have to get to work. That's where everything unfolds. So a multilinear complex can fold back on itself with intersections and inflections that interconnect philosophy, the history of philosophy, history in general, the sciences and the arts, as though these are so many twists and part of something moving through space like a whirlwind that can materialize at any point. Questioner. But we're not talking about just any point, we're talking about Leibniz. Everyone knows about Leibniz, but they know about him from Candide. 
And Voltaire's mocking reference to the best of all possible worlds, I'm going to ask you a silly question. Does it damage the way a philosopher is remembered to be laughed at like that? Deleuze. But Voltaire's a philosopher too, and Candide's a major text. The relationship between Leibniz and Voltaire marks a fundamental transition in the history of thought. With Voltaire, we're in the Enlightenment, a system of light, indeed, a matter of life, of reason, quite different from the Baroque system, even though Leibniz opened the way into this new period. Theological reasons break down, giving way to human reason, pure and simple. The Baroque itself already marks a crisis in theological reasoning, a final attempt to reconstruct a world that's falling apart. It's a bit like the way they define schizophrenia. And what we call Baroque dances have often been compared to the postures assumed by schizophrenics. Now, when Leibniz says our world's the best of all possible worlds, we have to understand the best as replacing the classical good and reflecting precisely the collapse of the good. Leibniz's idea is that our world's the best, not because it's governed by the good, but because it allows the production and introduction of new elements. It's a very striking idea, and one that Voltaire himself takes up. And it's a long way from Leibniz's supposed optimism. Indeed, for Leibniz, the very possibility of progress depends on his Baroque conception of damnation. The best of all possible worlds rises up on the shoulders of the, of the damned because the damned have themselves forsaken progress and so set free infinite quantities of progressivism, progressiveness. There's a wonderful piece about this called The Philosopher's Profession of Faith, beautifully translated into French by Belaval. There's song, there's song of Beelzebub's in the book, which must be the finest of all texts on evil. These days, it's no longer theological reason, but human reason, enlightenment reason, that's entering a crisis and breaking down. So in our attempts to preserve some part of it or reconstruct it, we are seeing a neo-Baroque, which brings us closer, perhaps, to Leibniz than Voltaire. So in our attempts to preserve some part of it or reconstruct it, we are seeing a neo-Baroque, which brings us closer, perhaps, to Leibniz than Voltaire. Last question. Along with Vold the Fold, you're publishing a short, luminous piece on Francois Châtelet's philosophy, Pericles and Verdi. Should we take the way this major book on philosophy is preceded and followed by two texts devoted to Michel Foucault and Francois Châtelet, de departed friends, as somehow significant, as relating in particular to the sense of filien in philosophy? Are you trying to bring into philosophy and or the writing of philosophy the music? The Châtelet, uh, as you recall, defined as establishing human relations in our own material. Deleuze. You talk in the first place about friendship. I wrote a book about Foucault and then a little piece about Châtelet. But they're not, for me, just tributes to friends. The book on Foucault was very much meant as a philosophy book. And by writing a philosophy book entitled Foucault, I was claiming that he never turned into a historian, but always remained a great philosopher. Francois Châtelet for his part, thought of himself more as a philosophy producer rather than rather as one who talks uh, a film producer. But then in film, a lot of producers have wanted to establish new modes of production, new ways of running things. What I'm trying to show all too sketchily is that what Châtelet saw himself doing was, wasn't a substitute for philosophy, but involved, on the contrary, a very original and definite philosophy. And then there's the question of friendship. It's intrinsic to philosophy because the question of friendship, because philosopher isn't a sage, but a friend of whom what? Kojev, Blanchot, Moscalot have taken up this question of friendship, which goes to the heart of thought. You can't know what philosophy is until you confront the puzzling question and find some answer, however difficult that may be. You ask about music too, since Châtelet was immersed in music. Music are philosophers' friends of music too. Music are philosophers' friends of music too. It seems clear to me that philosophy is truly an unvoiced song with the same feel for movement that music has. That already applies to Leibniz who, paralleling Baroque music, makes harmony a basic concept. He makes a philosophy the production of harmonies. What In, the, in that what friendship is, a harmony embracing even dissonance? It's not a matter of setting philosophy to music or vice versa. Rather, it's once again one thing folding into another, fold by fold, like Boulouz or Mariam. That is the end. That was a conversation uh, with Robert Maggiore from September 22nd, 1988. Thanks for listening.